Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Hi, I'm Roxanne Meshar. Welcome to Access to Democracy. And my guest today is Sandra Mason, Representative Sandra Mason from the Minnesota House of Representatives representing District 51A. And Hello. welcome back to oh, Access to pleasure. Democracy. You've been here many times before. And I know you just got back from a wonderful conference where all kinds of things are going on. And we're really talking about building a better world today. And this conference, in fact, um, that was a big topic on, on, on the plate for, for where you just finished. So maybe mm -hmm. share a little bit where it was and uh, what you learned there. Okay, and actually I, it was two conferences of, okay. and they were both in Washington, D.C. and okay. the first one was uh, opened with, on, on opening day. We were in the uh, White House Administration Building. Really? Which nice. was real, yeah, first time I have ever <laughs> actually been in that building, so that was exciting. But we had a chance to hear from the communications director uh, for the White House, as well as the labor secretary, somebody from higher education. And one of the things that uh, they were coming to us again and again is because Congress seems to have so much difficulty in making progress that they are going to start trying to reach out to the states thinking that the states will be are in a better position tr to try and move some of these issues forward. And, and sometimes that's true. Sometimes it really can be done locally better uh, and maybe more quickly than at a federal level for some things. And I'm thinking that's true because, again, we're talking about education. We're ca talking about jobs, mm -hmm. uh, transportation. So, I mean, these are all things that we're doing at the state level yes. in any event. So that was exciting. So one of the conferences called SIX, or State Innovation Exchange. Exactly. Think, yeah. Uh, and so what was that conference all about? What do they do? Basically, they were just trying to, uh, it's a new, fairly new organization, but it's trying to get particularly progressive legislators uh, information and support so they can be a, a more active in getting across some of the issues, you know, actually dealing with the economy, dealing with uh, poverty issues, et cetera. Which is, which is mainly women and children by Ex and large. Yeah. Absolutely. Actually, and one of the speakers that I heard during the week, and this was, I think she was from the Women's Policy Institute, was saying that if we could actually raise women's wa wages, because right now mm -hmm. we know that there's women are still have an incredibly right. disparity in everything in adjusted for there's still a Ex uh, yes it's across the board wages, right. and then particularly uh, african-american and latino women are making even less which mm -hmm. just kind of boggles my mind mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. how that is able to happen but nevertheless she said if we were able to get women to making uh, wages that were at parity, we could probably erase 50% of the poverty in this country. Wow, that's so amazing. That, so, I mean, I think that's an incredible st uh, stimulus for st to, uh, to push us forward yes, at least. Yes, that's motivating. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, you were also at something called Juan Will. Will, right. And share a little yeah. bit about what's that okay. all about. Uh, and it's a combination of two organizations. WAND was formed many years ago to deal with the nuclear issue. And then once that was resolved, 
they are now called Women for a New Direction. Okay. And then uh, Will is Women Legislator Lobbies, uh, Lobbyists. Okay. Is in it. So, but basically the platform is the same, where we are trying to do things, again, focusing on women's issues both nationally and then internationally as well. Because when we go to our day on the Hill, uh, usually we have three topics. One has to do with a nuclear tre treaty, uh, and then or, well, nuclear uh, things in general, but also the federal budget. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're asking them is to really cut down on the discretionary funding given to the Pentagon, because that's being spent on probably on equipment that will never ever be used. Who and knows what, yeah. <laughs> from, from the perspective of state legislators, we can use that for education, we can use it for infrastructure, for transportation. Yeah. So that's been the constant ask, ask as long as I've been <laughs> in the legislature. And then uh, we're also talking about women and uh, peace and security, and there's also a bill on that. But one of the push that we ask is again, if there's when there's peace treaties, that women are at the table and other stakeholders. So if there's a treaty that signed, there is going to be more of a buy-in, and that it will be successful. That's very important, and it's you as a woman representing Minnesota is important. I just came back from a conference in Europe and. I was in Slovenia and it was interesting there. The ratio in that country of um, women uh, representatives in government to men, it's nine men, seven women. So it's extremely high, almost 50-50. It's the highest in Europe. We oh aren't goodness. anywhere near that here in this country, but women like yourself. And in Minnesota, we do have Lori Swanson and um, Rebecca Otto and other women too who are uh, trying to make things better locally at the state level and encourage leadership and, and improve, um, uh, help lift people out of poverty, basically improve um, uh, poverty issue and other issues too in the state. So really nice that you're able to go to a conference like this and represent our state um, and be there. What, what stays with you most from the two days of conferencing? The one thing is the fact that uh, the statistic that I mentioned on poverty. I mean, it's the fact that if we could get women to be paid what they should be paid, yes. that we could really make a dent in the poverty level. And when we know that a huge percentage of people that are living in poverty are women and children, I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. How yes. can we not be doing more to focus on that? It makes all the difference. Because if the children are having, a, you know, if they're if they're getting the food they need, the medical treatment Nutrition. that they need. They can function in school then, and exactly. then the education sticks, and then exactly. they can move forward. Yes, it makes all the difference. And you know, again, women, we have many women that are head of households, mm -hmm. and that's, it, that should be something that we should be, it should be solvable, in yes. my opinion. Yes. We just need more people working on it. <laughs> I'm going to go back to uh, the conference. Sounds so interesting, and we wanted to kind of to check in about that. But uh, I originally wanted to ask you a little bit about um, your journey into state government for viewers. You know, how did you end up as a state representative? If you can share briefly uh, how you got here. I don't know about briefly, but I can <laughs> okay. tell you. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Uh, I have always been interested in history and government, and then I once I graduated and I majored in government in college, and what I have. Ever since then, I've been active in political organizations, so to speak. But then when we moved to Egan, I had two children, two little children, that needed a place to play. And so back home, we used to have this big field behind our house where the city would just come and plot, you know, cut the grass so the kids could play there. Nothing fancy, just, you know, just cut the grass or weeds, whatever they were. And so I went over to the Egan City Hall and that was my ask at that point in time. And then from there, I found out about the Park Commission, so I got into the Park Commission. And, and I do want to take time out that when I, at that point, Barb Schmidt was the Egan Parks Director. And, you know, so Barb and I go way back and just, Barb died earlier this year. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And f from, from being the director for Egan Park, she went on to be the director for the Dakota County Parks, mm -hmm. and then 
virtually until the time she died. Mm -hmm. She was also, then she, mm -hmm. uh, when she left uh, Dakota County, she's been working on the Metro Council Commission yeah. on Open Spaces. So, I mean, she has done so much for the community. Mm -hmm. and, and when you talk about anything in our area, you know, Barb is there. So, And of course, parks add so much to the quality of life here huge. in Minnesota. Yeah. I mean, especially when I was on the Egan City, I went from the Parks Commission to the Egan City Council. And that's what most people remember about Egan, is our parks and our trails. And, uh, and I was on the uh, Parks Commission when we really passed the re referendum that put in a lot of the amenities that are in the parks. I mean, they've had several since then, but that to me was just so exciting to be able to do that. I mean, that was huge. It's a huge improvement in quality of life that people still enjoy today, thanks to your work mm -hmm. and others too who were willing to do this. So you ended up on the city council, and then what happened after then that? Then, when uh, after I left the city council, I was just basically working, and then uh, at one point they needed a representative to run for or somebody to run for the representative in what was then 38A mm -hmm. and a couple of from friends said if if I agreed to run they will do everything that they could to help me get me elected so uh, after much thought I said yes mm -hmm. and they did <laughs> and I've been very very fortunate the rest is history serving. so and you've been um, working now in the House of Representatives how many years this is now my fourth term okay so quite a while mm -hmm. so your experience so you can get a lot of things done. One of the things I know that you did that even affected me personally and many other people too is um, you were very instrumental in creating the red line, were you not? Which yes, I still want to thank you for because I use that. Um, my husband and I use it all the time and uh, we've gone to the airport and connected with the green line and the blue line on that. It's just been fabulous. So maybe explain what the red line is and how you happen to work with that. Okay. Because I was so heavily involved in transportation when I was on the city council, I was on, most of that time I was a liaison to the Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. Okay. So when I got to the legislature, it was really important to me to be on the transportation committee, and I have been on the transportation committee ever since. Uh, and obviously, in our area, it's a growing area. We have a lot of people that go across the river. And so for us to be able to be the pilot project for the Red Line, which is, it's bus rapid transit. We can't quite afford to get rail across the river yet, but we could do the best we could with the bus rapid transit. And I agree with you. I tend to use it a lot. And I know especially people going to the Twins game, et yes. cetera, they use it going, going into Minneapolis. Yes, into Minneapolis, into St. Paul. The wonderful thing about it, it runs about every 15 or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has basically its own lane if you're going in and out of, if Mall of America is the big connection point, and it is for right. other buses and so forth, or if you're going into St. Paul or Minneapolis on the light rail. Uh, it has its own lane. So I used to wonder what happens during rush hour. Well, if they're backed up on... Uh, Cedar, will I no longer now get there mm -hmm. on time? No, the bus gets its own lane, has its own exit and its own entrance into the uh, switching point or the transportation hub underneath Mall of America. So it gets you there in six or eight minutes no matter what, no matter the weather, no matter the traffic can be at a standstill on Cedar and that bus, it has its own entrance, exit, everything and it continues to go. So for very minimal money, um, and cheaper than I can drive my car there, I can hop on that bus and be there in no time and get on the light rail and be into downtown Minneapolis just that fast. And I might add that the buses that are used on the BRT have essentially the same amen amenities that the light rail does. Yes, so they're you, nice. Uh, they're very it, nice. It, yeah. They operate at ground level when you're getting on, which yes. is a really helpful yes. if you have, have any uh, prob have mobility problems. Yes, any, th any disability or any wheelchairs or strollers or anything like that. These uh, have the uh, doors that lower down and um, uh, entrance and exit areas that lower down and very comfortable inside when you're riding on them. So very, they're brand new, they're very nice, uh, and they're crowded. People use them, It's the ridership is good. So thank it you. Has been very, <laughs> yeah, it has been very successful. So that helps get people out of their cars and know that there's another way uh, to get where they're going, which is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. um, so you are yourself a parent, as you mentioned, and you have been very active in the area of uh, welfare for children over the years, um, especially nutrition for children. Um, 
Can you tell us a little more about what's happening in this area in terms of state government and what we're trying to do for um, nutrition for kids? Anything that pops to mind? Well, I mean, in the last session, yeah, I do. Yeah, if you'll remember, uh, Governor Dayton particularly wanted to make sure that children had uh, adequate f food when they yes. were in schools, which is really important. And then what's been happening this year, for instance, is Congress is more or less threatening, I guess, or is not, it looks like they may not fund some of the program that provide nutrition to children, which is very, very problematic and alarming. And I know there are a number of organizations, and particularly many of the church-related organizations, that have been trying to uh, reach uh, congressmen about this, that they just believe that the federal government needs to continue these programs at least at the status quo and probably even more because the it just seems like things are getting worse rather than better and again it goes back to income and exp how everything else is going yes. up but incomes are not and and this is a minnesota value for us that exactly um, people deserve um, good nutrition by virtue of being human persons, that people deserve clean air and um, safe spaces to play, safe neighborhoods to live in, clean water to drink, not because we can earn it or we can pay it back by virtue of being human beings, by virtue of being human. This is a Minnesota value that people so have access to. So I mean, that. that is a really big issue, and obviously, shouldn't use that word, but when we're looking at Congress and the fact that they're not getting a lot done at, at this point right. that it, it's extremely concerning so yeah. again i'd appreciate if people would contact their uh their federal representatives and yes. just tell them that it real it's so very important it to is fund important the yeah. programs that help the children <laughs> you mentioned earlier too income inequality especially for women um, particularly uh, women of color it's even worse um, so uh, there are some key issues here. I know you had um, talked about in the past uh, funding transparency and financial industry regulation and investments that align with our values. Maybe say a little more about funding transparency and its uh, relationship to inequality. Okay. Uh, that tends to, yeah, that one tends to be probably a little bit more difficult to explain, but essentially uh, one of the ways if, if people and in some cases, like for, for government, I mean, we, you can find out what anybody is making. Correct. That tends to be a little bit more difficult when you're do, dealing with private resources. Yes, yes. And, and actually even some semi-private. And it really shouldn't be. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so those are things that we need to take, take into consideration. And from my perspective, I believe that there are people that are making, to me, what are outrageous salaries mm -hmm. and as individuals I think and this is where it's going to start because I don't think this is going to be a pro uh, problem that government can truly solve but if you have if you have uh, any stock you know pay attention to when they have the annual meeting yes pay attention to how much they're paying their their people at the top and also the the people at the lower levels as well because Right now, I believe most CEOs, or the, the, what they're using as uh, the average, is 300% above the lowest paid crazy. person. Right. And that's, that has not been the way that we have been over the many no. decades. Mm -hmm. This is new. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the problem. And yet, sometimes when I'm listening to some of the bills that are coming across uh, when we're in discussion mm -hmm. in the House, they're always trying to attack, you know, the tip credit. Again, mm -hmm. they're going after servers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how many millionaire servers you <laughs> know, but I don't know any. Yeah. And then, you know, again, for, for the teaching profession, they're going always going after people Who that don't are making... Who don't make much in the first place yeah. or are barely making a living wage or a fair wage for what they do. They're decent wages, maybe. Yes, yes. But those are the people that they are always trying to cut down the salaries. And nobody ever talks about these people that are making outrageous salaries that, I guess, to me are... Pretty hard to justify. Well, yeah. uh, to me, they're unethical or moral. Yes. I, I just don't see how you can be ahead a company and know yeah. you're making this 
astronomical amount of money, and yet people below your are working part time or not being not given an opportunity making, to work full time, and certainly not a living wage. And when so. you're talking healthcare, yeah. especially, you've got people working two, maybe even more mm -hmm. jobs just to try to survive. And when we say the poor, we need to be clear, it's the working poor. In other words, and, and the working uh, poor often are working two, three jobs, often single heads of households, and um, they are trying very hard to better their circumstances, but if you can't get a full-time job with benefits and you're ending up with cobbling together two or three part-time jobs, that's hard to put a family life together. It's hard to find daycare for your children. It's hard to do many things, certainly, um, to have the kind of benefits that a full-time position would afford, and it makes it very difficult to move ahead or to save or to have um, really time to spend with your children. Makes it exactly. Hard. There was one woman, I remember when we were discussing uh, pay equity, and she had, I can't remember if she had two or three jobs, and she also had several children, and uh, her tears started coming down because she said she hardly ever gets to see the kids. Yes, yes. And, and that's really difficult. It's true. And then this past session, I have been on the aging and long-term care. And I cannot tell you how many people that employ health care workers have said, I mean, they are having so much trouble maintaining their employees. One person, actually, he had 100% turnover last year. Wow. And. S another woman f who has a, uh, manages a facility was saying what they like to do every Christmas is to have their staff buy presents for mm -hmm. their residents. But she said when you have turnover like that, I mean, the staff really doesn't even get a chance to know. They don't know the, the residents. Pa patients. Yeah. And, yeah. and we all know. I mean, if you have mental health issues, if you're uh, Alzheimer's, any, any mm -hmm. type of condition uh, like that, I mean, stability is incredibly important. Yes, and to have the person helping you every day or from day to day be changing over and over again, it's difficult. It makes maintaining your health difficult, and it's difficult for the employees, too, who are forever new, forever learning, uh, never feeling like they're mastering the task um, and maybe moving on to the next thing. And, it's hard. and the work that these healthcare workers does do is, I mean, it's backbreaking it's physical, and difficult right. work. There's yeah. a lot of physical work. I mean, it's again, they're dealing with people in many cases who may not be able to be uh, totally let them know all their needs, but it's it's huge work. So you just highlighted one of the critical issues we face going forward as we see our population age, and that is a stable um, group of employees who are paid fairly, who can care for them. Other critical issues you see in the area of aging and um, senior care or uh, an aging society? It's, you know, I think the health care uh, uh, piece is, is huge, but going back to transportation, I mean, as people are aging, they are not being should not be driving, yes. probably. <laughs> Hence the red line is so critical, and more things like the red line or right. other kinds of red line, whether it's an orange line or whatever it is, but yes, it's critical. But uh, I was attending a uh, conference about a month ago for, it was a national conference of state legislators, and uh, there was one particular uh, seminar on transportation options, and that's where they're bringing up things like Uber or shared cars, etc. And the, this one indi uh, man in particular said, especially our younger people are no longer willing to spend so much money on automobiles. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know, and from they the Transportation don't. Committee, I can tell you, I mean, we're told again and again, as people are graduating from colleges, they're looking for places where there is public transportation. Yes. Because they do not want to invest in automobiles. And yet, Uber is not the answer because it's externalizing costs onto citizens and the taxpayer, which they should be taking themselves. They aren't paying benefits. They aren't doing all kinds of things that they mm -hmm. ought to be doing and would be if they were a normal taxi firm, for example. So all those costs are being um, turned into profits by Uber, for example, um, and, and we foot the bill for that, you and I and, and other taxpayers. Yeah. Well, have to, and there are some others, you know, like there is the sh shared car. Mm -hmm. And actually on the news last night, they said the airport is looking at how to use some of these ah. shared automobile type uh, 
which is interesting. You see a lot of that in Europe, too, and it seems to work pretty well, actually, the shared car idea. That's an, an interesting idea, especially if you can drop it right at your home and you don't have to return it anywhere, and then the next person can pick it up. So. Exactly. So those are things that we're, you know, we obviously have to be looking at, and those are some of the options, but transportation needs are changing, and it's something that we need to be really keeping abreast of and trying to do the best we can for uh, for our citizens. Now, in Dakota County, there is uh, a woman who's employed at DARTS that's been working on a, uh, a study, two-year study, so it's going to be coming to the end. But, I mean, she has been exploring all the various transportation, uh, particularly volunteer-driven transportation uh -oh. modes. Which is a big area, actually. Right. Yeah. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that comes out and if we're able to expand some of the resources within the county. So I'm real. I mean, I'm really excited about that. Is exciting. Yes. Yeah. So we have another <laughs> number option, number of uh, out of the box options of sharing <laughs> and uh, volunteering and public transport and all kinds of things that are possibilities. Mm -hmm. We only have a couple minutes left, and I know one of the things I admire about um, the work you do is that you really talk to everyone in your dis district. And is it true you knock on every door? I, I try. Okay. <laughs> I really try. Okay. You're pretty close, I it's, think. It's, You're, you spend it's, a lot of time. It's right. It's, yeah. uh, I know, to me it's important. I mean, when after you win the election, you do have to represent everybody. and. And it's, in our district, it's really hard to communicate with people. Not everybody reads the newspaper. Certainly, I don't get any television coverage <laughs> except local <laughs> television coverage. And so the best way of doing that is actually at the doors or attending. You know, if people invite you to various meetings, et cetera. But it, it, that's critical to have What's feedback. one of your most memorable encounters at a door knocking? What, what sticks out in your mind? Anything? That's trying to think about one that was recently, but actually probably the more recent one was somebody, again, she works in healthcare, ah. and, and she knew that I had been working on mm. that. But again, I mean, just, you know, she was stressing the importance of raising the wages of people in that field because they're having, uh, she was more in a management position and just, again, emphasizing how important it is for us to be able to pay these people the wages that they're needed to be paid. So it's interesting. You can share information about what interests you, but you also learn from people when you door knock. Um, oh, so absolutely. You have a person in management who can share with you what's important. Um, that's pretty pretty useful. Exactly. We're just finishing up, but I wanted to thank you so much for joining us. And I know um, go to rep.sandra.mason at house.mn if you want to connect with Sandra and, sh and share any concerns or issues. But thank you so much okay. for being on Access And I to do have an email if you go to yes. that address as well. Uh, I try to get something out at least every few weeks or something to keep po people posted very on what good. I'm doing. Very good. So thank you. Oh, thank and you. thank you for joining us. Bye now.